world gone insane. An upside down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Hey everybody, Dana Gould here. How you doing? Don't panic. This is not the Halloween episode, but the Halloween episode is coming. So this is what went on. Um, In August, because of a car accident I was in, the whole schedule for the podcast got sort of thrown up in the air for a lot of things. Um, And now I'm getting back on schedule. Uh, Didn't really have time to put out an effective September episode. What came out in early September was the August episode, which was delayed because of C, accident, comma, car. Anyway, so... There are two interviews that uh, I wanted to do for September, and what I thought I would do is we're going to split them up. So this episode is with Patty Schemmel, who's a brilliant uh, musician. She was the drummer for uh, the band Hole. She had a first-person account of uh, the Seattle scene in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and uh, she's written a brilliant book called Hit So Hard, which also has uh, a documentary that was made. So Patty... Uh, is uh, this interview, and this is what I did. Just to get it out, it's just the interview. Me and Patty talking, almost as if I had a regular podcast. Um, So I hope you enjoy it. The other interview is with Edward Pepitone. That's on our Patreon page. So if you're a Patreon member, go on over there and listen to an interview with Eddie Pepitone. The Halloween episode will be out around October 20th, and that's going to be a whopper. Uh, it stars uh, Dolomite Is My Name screenwriters Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski. They also wrote Ed Wood, People vs. Larry Flint, People vs. O.J. Simpson, Man on the Moon. So many amazing, amazing movies. And they're great guys, hilarious storytellers, and uh, super good friends of mine. I'm so happy to. And Dolomite Is My Name, go see it. it stars Eddie Murphy. It's the uh, biopic of Rudy Ray Moore. Uh, Dolomite, it's fantastic. Uh, I can't say enough good about it. And you'll hear all about that on the Halloween episode. Also, Jeffrey Combs. He starred in a little movie called Reanimator uh, and many, many others. Uh, anybody who's a fan of the genre knows Jeffrey Combs. And also, Mike Mendez and Matt Weinhold are going to give us a, uh, a year-end recap of uh, horror films. Uh, they're, uh, Mike Mendez, a very talented writer and director, made uh, Don't Kill It, Big Ass Spider. Matt Weinhold is the co-host of the excellent podcast Monster Party. Uh, so that's all coming up for Halloween later this month. But for now, this should uh, make up for the lost time in August. Uh, and uh, if you're a Patreon member, go on over there and hear me and Eddie Pepitone. And uh, if you're not a Patreon member, why don't you become one? Go on down to DanaGould.com and sign up. It's pretty good. Before we get going, here are some shows that you should know about. If you are in the New York area on October 11th, we are doing Plan 9 from Outer Space live at the Tarrytown Music Hall as part of the Sleepy Hollow Film Festival. It stars Scott Adsit, Jeffrey Combs, Frank Conniff, Bobcat Goldthwait, me, Gene Gray, Paul Greenberg, John Hodgman, Jonah Ray, Jackie Harris Greenberg, G. Charles Wright, and Kat Agason as Vampira. Then, on October 29th, Plan 9 from Outer Space in Los Angeles, only at Largo. And that also has an all-star cast. Uh, me, again, Bobcat Goldthwaite, Janet Varney, Matt Bronger, Tom Kenny. Jonah Ray, Lorraine Newman, Paul F. Tompkins, Stephen Weber, G. Charles Wright, and once again, Catherine Augustin as Vampira. That's October 29th at Largo. And then in November, from the 7th to 9th, I will be in St. Louis, Missouri at the Helium Comedy Club. Uh, November 14th, 15th, and 16th, I will be in Boston at the Boston Comedy Festival. And November 21st, 2nd, and 3rd, I will be in Minneapolis, Minnesota at Acme Comedy Company. Three great gigs. And then in December, back to San Francisco. But that's enough for now. 
All right, everybody. That's good. Here's the show. Listen up and then go over to Patreon and yeah, all that stuff. It is a lovely sun dapple day. We're getting into fall. Yeah. Temperatures dipping down into the mid 90s. Crows bursting into flames as they fly across the sky. And uh, we are here at Falcon's Lair Recording Studios, high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California, where the powers that be and their friends hang out. On a guest today's podcast, uh, came to us by way of friend of the podcast, Rob Zabrecki. She has an amazing uh, book and a documentary. The book is called Hit So Hard. It is a brutally honest and, and freakishly easy to read book that I want to actually talk to her about. Uh, many know the author. Certainly, if you're a, a listener of this podcast, and uh, we all tend to share the common interest, as uh, the drummer for the band Hole, but uh, her story uh, of that and survival coming out of the the 90s and the early aughts in one piece. Um, yep. It's pretty amazing. Please welcome Patty Schemmel. Hi. Thanks how for having me. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for coming <clears throat> on. Yeah, it is a beautiful day. Um, now, how do you know Zabrecki? Just from... From you know, early music, from playing shows when he was in his band, Possum Dixon, but also through his magic, going to see his show. Uh -huh. And then he asked me to be on his show that he was doing, the, the, the seance show that I think he yeah, yeah, yeah. you... And uh, so I did a, a little guest spot on that. And uh, hilarious. Yes. Like many former musicians, he is now a magician. <laughs> In a good one. I know yeah. he's amazing. Yeah. He's, 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 he's jaw dropping. Yeah. Um, but you're still a musician. Yes, I'm a musician. And, and a mom. And, and a mom. And uh -huh. I also teach woodworking to kids and a lot of different things. Uh huh. Yeah. What's interesting is you grew up in, in Washington State. Yeah. And. You were at the perfect age to be in the the, the grunge scene in the nineties. You knew Cobain from yes. yeah, we, uh, that scene. You knew Cobain before you knew Courtney yeah, Love. You met yeah. but what but what I find interesting is, you know, that was a very druggy scene. Mm -hmm. And you grew up in a world of sobriety. Yeah. Both my parents were in recovery and they came out to the northwest from Brooklyn in right. New York where they met each other in a AA meeting. And, so and you had AA meetings like in, in your house, house as a kid. Yeah. And it like old school, you know, and there was always, you know, coffee and that old coffee on. Yeah. yeah, yeah and cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And my parents would have, there was a thing called the, the, the 12 step where, you know, we, they'd go out and help a person in need, you know, that sure. bring them over. And so there was always that going on in, uh -huh. the, in, in the living room. And, and um, those people are always great. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. So the yeah, I grew up in in kind of the the twelve steps in recovery were sort of our guideline for living in our house. And uh, but um, and so of course I I got dealt with the double whammy of having two parents and uh, that are alcoholics. So I guess you know then of course I I've got the gene. Sure. Uh, yeah. Know, it's in my DNA. I know that gene. Yeah. Yeah, so I had my first drink at 12. Was it a rebellious thing because your parents, like... Not at was all. Just you know, a normal 12-year-old? My, my parents got divorced when I was 11. And then then uh, all of a sudden, that was sort of my... They weren't home, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there, what, my brother and I had this, you know, had the television. And that right. was it. And, you know... And you're in Oly Olympia? Or? No, in uh, Marysville. Marysville, which but... Is between Seattle and Vancouver, B.C., is there an element of the fact that you don't see the sun a lot? I, I, I believe so. Yeah, I mean, no, because my friend, Dra yeah. I, have a, I have a really good friend named Drake Sather, who is from Seattle, and he's a comedian and a writer and brilliant, and, and sadly took his life years ago. And he had serious depression issues all of his life. And he would say that, I grew up in a basement drinking coffee, 
because it was raining all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Know, and, like, and that's like, I think that so if you uh, live in a cure song, <laughs> our music, you know, the Seattle sound was it. We all were in bands because every house had a basement. Right. And the, it was always raining and we would drink beer and play music in someone's basement. Right. You know, rent was cheap. And that's how Seattle, the Seattle scene came around. No one ever thought that it would be something people would notice it or think it's cool or anything. We were just doing our thing. Yeah. Well, it was like, like any artistic scene, yeah. it, it arrived out of a combination of environmental elements, right. economic elements, and a social scene. All Focus. my friends are into the same thing. We all kind of dress the same because kids of the same age all, dress the same. All the parents right. were worked at the mill, so there's like the everybody had a flannel, right, from the lumberjacks. Yeah, and know? it's also because it's cold. <laughs> yes, so yeah. And it must have been so strange to you to see now they're selling. I just remember like when the when the grunge look went to Urban Outfitters, mm -hmm. and it's like. High end flannel shirts. I know, and still to this day, laughable. I have a moment. I at least every couple months where I'm out in the world, you know, shopping or something, and I come across something like, you know, a Nirvana T-shirt at the Target, and it, I have that moment where I'm like, Whoo, whoa, you know, yeah, and I kind of yeah. look up at the ceiling and go, wow, you know, think sure. about what is what does Kurt think of it, <laughs> you know, like sure. and, yeah. And, and people wearing Nirvana shirts that don't know, right? The, wouldn't know if it's on the radio. Or yeah, and, and it's like he's—it's become sort of like classic rock. Like you see a Hendrix shirt. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I always felt when Straight Out of Compton came out, mm -hmm. the, the movie, and then you see like Straight Out of Yoga Class, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> and how people who live. In South uh, Central must feel, oh, this, you know, like women know. in Brentwood, you know, like, you know oh. straight out of hot yoga. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's wrong. It's the great, the great American co-opt. It's a long and proud tradition. Oh my you, so you had your first drink at 12. Yeah. By what age would you say you were an alcoholic? Right. That from, that from, from get-go? I mean, I, I drank and then all of a sudden it was like you hear uh, so many alcoholics say that. Finally, then there was that sort of ease and that comfort, like a blanket, you know, like, uh, oh, yeah. okay, uh -huh. this is, ah, uh, now, now, now I can function. begin and function. Yeah. yeah. And there's that other thing that it's, it, it's interesting and in your development gets pinned at that uh -huh. age. Yeah. So you don't learn how to, you know, instead of dealing with uh, dysfunction and relationships and family, you just drink and yeah. then you never really grow emotionally or the book hit so hard. One of the theses of the book uh -huh. is that being in a band fuels addiction. That the social structure of a band, your lifestyle, your the mo availability of money, it's a perfect storm. Yeah, like, we're gonna make you. Yeah, what, when when I got into <laughs> you my... have to have brutally strict rules of self control, right? And to not slide down that rabbit and... hole. I came up playing in bands, and then when I got into Hole, it was, okay, here's a band. I'm going to be able to pay my bills with music. And so it was like I'd struck gold because I didn't have to work. And I thought, oh, this is, this is how it is. You get to drink all day and, you know, right. not really. <laughs> yeah. As I explained in the book, you got to show up. Mm -hmm. I mean, and especially if you're the drummer. I mean, you get a little more right. leeway if you're the singer. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much. You yeah. Know, you've you've really got to. Yeah, you can just breeze in and, and breeze out. Yeah, because that's part of your deal. It's like, sure. well, so-and-so didn't show up. Where I grew up, when I grew up, everyone, it was mandatory. And I know two kids that didn't do this, and they were both fined. You had to read No One Here Gets Out Alive at the age of 13. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did, but yeah, I'm a little yeah. older, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you had to read it. And the <laughs> stories of, um, of John Densmore, who literally... No one here gets out alive is the yeah. book Danny Sugarman wrote about the doors, doors yeah. and uh, Danny Sugarman literally getting hives from dealing with Jim Morrison, who was the singer and could just breeze in and blow. And it is also like you read it when you're older and you go like, oh, this guy was just a really nice guy who was a sad alcoholic who, when he was drunk, was an asshole. Mm -hmm. And eventually you're just 
drunk more than you're sober and you're an asshole more than you're a nice guy. Right. And it's just that simple. Yeah. And it's a, being an alcoholic, you're, you have that weird ego where you think, you know, you're better than, but you're not. So you do. Yeah. You're, someone just, so people are really blowing smoke a lot, you know? Yeah. So I'm sure someone described it as, and I wish this was mine. Yeah. You're the piece of shit. The sun revolves around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah Twenty-seven seems to be the age. Yeah, I don't know what it is about that age. Yeah, we do a, a segment in my doc about that. The twenty-seven. The yeah, year. I don't know what it is, but that's when everybody checks out. Yeah, that is just full bore. There's some sort of connection with your Saturn return. You I know. know. No, I, no, my twenty-seventh yeah. year. I, I have never had addiction problems, but I have all the pathology. I, I grew up with it. I literally just didn't do everything right. out of rebellion. Because I had four older brothers and two parents and everybody was drinking all yeah. the time and a younger sister. And so I literally was just like the Marilyn Munster. I just did everything differently, but uh-huh. still have the pathology. And when I started taking, uh, when, when, when I was 27, I just cracked up. I just started having panic attacks all the time and, uh-huh. and couldn't sleep and couldn't function. And I started, I went on antidepressant. I went on Zoloft, uh, anti-anxiety. And the doctor said, uh, who's still my doctor. And he said, uh, you know, you can uh, medicate with a sledgehammer or you can medicate with a scalpel. <laughs> that's really, yeah. that's really what it is. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, you can just the- obliterate yourself or you can do it a little more specifically. What was the thing growing up that connected you that you were like, if it, it's not drugs and alcohol, but it was like a thing that you said, oh, okay, this is my thing. This is how I feel good. Oh, I was an M, a, uh, like a, I was really into uh, monster movies and Star Trek yeah. and, and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I got into comedy. I wanted to be a comedian at around the age of 13 and 14. And I, and I started at 17. So I really just, bulldozed myself in that and i you know i i gravitated to that i was a usher at the movie theater yeah. i you know so, uh, I, the same. I gouged survival mechanisms out of the face of my upbringing <laughs> which is what you do yeah you know? and for um, me it was the same with music but also my brother and i dove into monster movies and would you know yeah w- where we lived we could only we could get a subscription of uh, fangoria you know yeah, sure. and then then you know we would get video when VCRs came out. That yeah, was like then our you, salvation. Yeah, yeah. And so that was our thing. It was monster movies and Planet of the Apes was it. And that that was all we did was... Do you know my, Yes, I okay. do. And so <laughs> so it was, like, all we did was do our ape collectibles. Oh, my God. And then... You know, Before you leave, movies, I'll blow your mind and, with a couple and then of, also we were really into kiss the band now, as and well so you was, should be and then so instead of that's you, the genius of kiss right. is they were a rock band and they were monsters i know and like everybody like people would look at you know in the 90s all my friends that weren't into kiss would be like why were you ever it's like a thing you get into when you're a kid it never leaves you no never no you know, like i know girls that were so into the spice girls and i'm like what but it's a thing. It just, just it, will yeah. never go away. It's comfort food. It, it, yes. it, it's what makes you feel good. It what makes and you feel happy. And that's what we did was collect and have ape talk with friends that were there was only very few people that were into apes. <laughs> Holy lord! I'm not kidding. And so we would have ape talk with friends that collected too, but they were like maybe two kids I knew, and then there was that one that wanted to be, but not really. Just didn't have it. <laughs> like just into the TV show and sure. not really. <laughs> All the way. How dare they? Yeah, no. This conversation is over. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, for the kids now, our kids, it's their phone. You know, somebody yeah. said a really interesting thing about music that Eddie Gordetsky, I don't know if you know Eddie Gordetsky, he's really brilliant. He's a comedy writer, television writer, but he's a, a musicologist. He produced Bob Dylan's Theme Time Radio Hour. He's uh, works with Elvis Costello a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a, and, he's, and he said, that, like, Kids don't place their dreams in music as much now as they do in gaming. That you can slide into the world of gaming more than we used to just put on our headphones. Yeah. They go into video games, which is an interesting... And that's their magical world. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's your way to be not here. I know my, my oldest daughter isn't into music at all. 
but is really into Fortnite and yeah. all of these. When you were, so you started drinking on 12, yeah. and then how, how quickly did that go into drugs? Let's see. Yeah, pretty quickly. I mean, I mean when, I'm once pretending I was, to yeah, not yeah, yeah. Know. Yeah. Once I, you know, had my first drink, then the, it's that chase to get, to have that feeling and right. to maintain it. So, which meant a lot of different chemistry, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, we, we, there's marijuana, just you're. You right. Know, and when I got into punk rock, I would go into the city and play mm-hmm. in bands and stuff. And there were uh, then cocaine shows up because you know you want to drink, but you also want, need to play drums. Right. So yeah, so it was just, and drums was always your instrument. Yeah, always. And did that was it because there was a a natural level of aggression that you just needed exactly. to yeah that yeah. was my release was uh-huh. to sit at drums and I was kind of had a lot of energy and pent up and. So when I and anybody drums, who's heard the Buddy Rich tapes knows that <laughs> drummers are by and large very serene. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Clams, yeah. clams. I'm gonna get your clams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How dare you play like Thank that for God. me? God, <laughs> I saw Buddy Rich. He came to like our local community college when I was a kid. My mom took me, and I remember he was smoking in the gymnasium, <laughs> playing, and he was an asshole. Oh no, well, he's, a, he's a, yeah. a, a monster. You said that one of the reasons that you got into drugs is that it, it helped you deal with your yeah. sexuality, but not repress it. I know firsthand, I, unrelated to all of the horrors of the Catholic Church, a lot of Catholic guys who are gay and are, grow up heavily religious think that there's something wrong with them and that the only way they can deal with this is to give their lives to God in the hopes that he will expunge or forgive them for right. it. And it is a self-imposed prison sentence. And then you, you go into this ludicrous culture where you're not supposed to have sex at all, which is the foundation of that is a real estate scam. Uh-huh. And it's so, so maddening. But in, in your case, you said that being inebriated helped facilitate your acceptance of your sexuality yeah. but it wasn't to repress it yeah, or it, deny it or run away from it yeah it was i just felt better about myself generally uh-huh. when i was on drugs and and, and right. it was there was a moment which i talk about in my book where i was at such a horrible point in my life and i remember i made a pass at a girl while i was drunk at a party mm-hmm. and you know of course shocking moment uh, it was, she's disgusted you know and I came out of that, and I would use alcohol as an excuse. Well, right. I was drunk. Sorry, I was drunk, oh. yeah. That was the impetus to me telling my mom that I was gay. Right. And, so, um, and then feeling okay about it, moving on. And their reaction was? Really supportive. Yeah. Yeah. I often wonder, my ex-wife is, is engaged to uh, her partner, who's mm-hmm. a woman. And do you change later that, or is it always there? Is it... I guess it's different for for everyone, yeah. but to grow up in a culture where such an integral part of your being gives you a sense of shame or wrong, it's uh, it's it's mind boggling. It's mm-hmm. mind boggling when you step back and look at it, you know. And the fact that it's still going on now in the twenty first yes. century is yeah, is, yeah. Uh, I I think about. That and just sort of putting pushing that out of my, you know, growing up and, and being like a teenager and like with all the stuff that goes on with that and identity and then mm-hmm. trying to squish down that part of myself. Getting into punk rock and the people that like punk rock helped me a lot to like everybody was a freak and it was OK to be. A freak. Yeah, yeah. That, that helped. That was a great thing about Cobain specifically. Yeah. Uh, who b- b- it was such a big star was that. His heart was so in the right place. Because, you know, I just interviewed a lot of people from the book about the 80s scene in L.A. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, yeah, I know. Uh, the, more Fun the, in the New World. Yeah, I read it. It's great. And, uh, and they're talking about how the initial burst of the punk scene was everybody's welcome. We're all freaks. It's I call it Pee Wee's Playhouse. We're all, you know, we're all yeah. welcome in Pee Wee's Playhouse, yeah. which is what you w- want the world to be. And then... Suddenly, it became really male and aggro. Like the OC kids yeah, came the up, hardcore, and it, yeah, yeah, and it became really fascist ideology and you know fetishizing all that juvenile horseshit. So the fact that Kurt Cobain, who was he, it bothered him that his became so popular that those people were fans of his. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and that must have must have dealt with you as well. You guys must have had that as well. Yeah. Not so much in my band, but uh, I mean, we... Well, you were an all... Well, not an all-girl band. Yeah. But it, it not so much. There wasn't a lot of that jock dude, you know, uh-huh. into hole. But I do... I know that... You can't yeah. pick your fans. Yeah. Our fans are pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I know it must have, I mean, I didn't, I don't know him, but I, I yeah. read enough that like, it really bothered him that those jerks liked his Yeah, music. it said that Nirvana became so, you know, mainstream Big, yeah, that yeah. like, yeah, the football team was yeah. listening to him. And that he would wear a dress just like to. Yeah, to, yeah, he took advantage to, of that. Yeah, to bum people out. <laughs> and now it's, you know, you see that we're in a new culture where there's nothing unusual about mm-hmm. being. Yeah. N- about anymore. being gay now. Yeah. Or, um, you know, being a different, in, you know, uh, I think music is, everybody's seen everything, it seems. Yeah. You, can't be, you can't be shocked, like, when I watched David Bowie get carried out on Saturday Night Live and do with Klaus Nomi. I'm yeah, like, I remember, I yeah. I freaked my mind out, and I was like, this is, ah, uh, the greatest. Does that moment still happen? You know? I don't know. I have a funny story about that actual thing. I remember watching, yeah, I think I've actually told this story on this podcast before, I remember watching the original SNL. Bowie was singing Boys Keep Swinging, Mm -hmm. and he was in a women's army corps outfit. He had a skirt on. Mm -hmm. And my dad came home. My dad would come home. He was a bartender, and he would come home, always get home in the middle of the second musical number of SNL. Uh Um, And he would, and I happened to be watching it alone. And he came in and looked at the TV and looked at me and leaned down right in my face, drunk, and just went, you like that queer, Dana? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Like, wow. No, hell no. I'm just making sure I recognize him in case I need to beat him up. But in fact, I remember when Prop 8 was here in LA, mm-hmm. in California, yeah. talking to my daughter who goes to a very progressive school, and she was like, what is it about? And I remember going like, well, some people don't like the idea that there are two mommies and two daddies. Mm-hmm. And she was just like, why? And and that, it was great in that I had to explain it. Yeah. But I remember a commercial for Prop 8, a girl comes home from school, and she goes, mommy, today in school they said that I could marry anybody I want. And I was thinking like, oh, good. this is." And then the mother goes, what? Uh-huh. And it was <laughs> Yeah. So why would you want your child to think they could marry anybody they want? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and it's just like, is, weren't we on the moon 40 years ago? Yeah. Like, how but do it, we go back? Still, though, you know, still today there's those moments. I mean, especially it seems it's like things have folded backwards. Yeah, they are. Inside itself. And, yeah. Uh, well, well, progress is, it retracts and expands. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're, we're in a cultural retraction now. and. It will expand at some point, uh, hopefully, before it's too late. There's a lot of economic elements that involved. You know, Mm -hmm. it boils down to you used to be able to make a really good living in this country swinging a hammer, Uh and you can't anymore. And you have to adapt. And evolution favors that which is the most adaptable to change. But you have a lot of people here that don't like the idea that they have to adapt. Mm -hmm. You know, Obama said, you can't work in a coal mine anymore. These are going out of business, but we'll train you. You can go to a trade school for free and you learn. And, and then another guy goes, no, I'm going to make it the fifties again. Yeah. And go, Woo-hoo! Uh-huh. It didn't work, but that's what the, it's easy. It's and people it's happened like that. before. I mean, there, if oh, people, this is, have, it's all people happened would before. still be riding carriages with horses. Yeah. It's all happened before oh. and it, it happens to different degrees. And then, you know, it's like, it's not your fault. It's Mexicans or communists or blacks or the Irish or witches or, you know, (laughs) it's whatever they want to say. Uh, it's all, it's all happened before. And the other thing, culturally, you're at this point where white male privilege is losing traction. And, you know, people complain about this white male culture of grievance that I see a lot in comedy. A lot of male comedians are like, women are ruining everything uh-huh. and you see what it is is like yeah white males have been ascendant in this country since its inception did you think they were gonna go quietly <laughs> 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 you know they're going uh-huh. you know and it's that's you know and it, i didn't say this but it's true when you're used to privilege equality feels like oppression mm-hmm. you know and that's all you're dealing with and as someone said, it wasn't me, and I wish it was, that Donald Trump is the fireworks display at the conclusion of white male privilege. 
know, it's like, yeah, it's just, yeah. there you go. Um, it would be fitting if he was followed by the first women president. That would be a great that, thing. But yes. yes. We don't, we don't know. But I, I want to get I want to get more into the the book hit so hard, which is yeah. a really one. Of, you'd never written a book before. No, and it's so readable. I it, had it, uh, I had help. You know what? Did what you I talk it? I approached it as. Uh, did you sit down and write it, or did you talk it? We, I talked it, and mm. you know we'd have phone calls. Right. Me and Aaron, who helped me write it, but sure. then I'd also go into um, you know we worked on a Google Doc, and so mm-hmm. I would just kind of be punk rock about it and just start yep. writing about a moment, and then she'd go in and go kind of move things around. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the most interesting books written by a musician, I thought, did you read Chronicle, the Dylan book? No. Because it just takes three very specific eras of his life. Uh-huh. It's like early 60s, 1969, 70, and like 1983 or something. And that's all it talks about. Why those specific? It's, uh, you know, like when he first kind of formed who he was, when he withdrew. Mm-hmm. And when he figured out how to keep going. Yeah. So it's fascinating in that regards, but it's like, I'm a blood on the tracks, desire era fan, uh-huh. and there's nothing in there. It's not in the, it's not in the focus. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so I, I found that, uh, I found that very interesting, but people are going to want to know. So you're, you're in Washington, you're in that scene. It's the eighties, late eighties yeah. and you're uh, drumming in bands your uh, functioning drug user and yes. functioning alcoholic yeah, for a bit. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, and as soon as I started to get busier in, in the band, it was more of a trying to coordinate, you know, when I could get high and when I, you know, to show up and then it's that sort of spiraled down into, yeah. uh, okay, I'm on the road. I'm in, you know, Iowa and I'm strung out. What right. am I going to do? It's so funny you say that because Charlotte Caffey's, stories and more fun in the new world uh-huh. are the same story but the music is the go-go yes. it's like people had no idea. idea i mean they were basically josie and the pussycats yeah, and, and by the time they broke they Charlotte were a punk and band. i are great friends yeah. and her stories are similar in uh, and it's amazing being a, such a big fan of the go-go's yeah. to hear charlotte talk about well look at the talk show video you can see there's a little bit of cocaine just around you know uh-huh. and like getting all the backstory is amazing yeah 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 but it is amazing because people just saw the go-go's like well, you got the yeah like, yes one no, they were no, a punk actually, band yeah, yeah yeah they had actually, a lot more than the behind the, the scenes <laughs> they yeah. had a jones yeah. <laughs> fueling your addiction fills your day yes and a lot of the people in my peer group uh, that came up and became successful didn't make it and how why did i make it i was doing the same things they were you mm-hmm. know and so coming through it i felt like you know, right i was asked if i wanted to write a book so i i did and and a lot of people say you know how did you do it how did you you know make it through and it's like there isn't one special i couldn't say well it was this because right. it's it's really a lot of different things and it's not one giant burning bush moment or something sure. you know yeah well especially and this is another thing you talk about in the book sobriety and getting clean is elusive mm. especially if uh to, to get it to stick um yeah there's like 27 rehabs yeah, 27 in there, i think rehabs, I don't know. 27 you know, just what was the, what ways. was the shortest period between uh getting out of rehab and using it oh my, hours mere hours, hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no people don't know i was on a plane from hazelden i landed i took the car to the you know it's, yeah yeah First thing Richard Pryor did when he got home from the hospital after setting himself on fire was go up in his bedroom at Freebase. Yes. I know it. I know yeah. that. Yeah. Moment. And it is that story, you know, when I'm alone, I'm in bad company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, my girlfriend at the time ODs and, you know, I, and, you know, ambulance comes, takes her, she's okay. But the first thing I did was like, that is some good dope. I'm going to, you know, and then just take advantage <laughs> wow. of it right there. You wow. Know, that's, yeah. yeah. You meet Kurt Cobain mm-hmm. pre Nirvana? Oh, no, during Nirvana. During Nirvana. They, they just gotten together. Yeah, they, had, they hadn't recorded Bleach yet. No. Right. And the scene is just starting to gel. It's yeah. just because you don't even know it's a scene. It's just right. you and your friends. Yeah. Everybody's playing shows that I was in a hardcore, kind of hardcore band. Well, we did some Stooges songs anyway, called The Primitives. And we played at this place called Community World Theater, which was an old movie theater in Tacoma. Mm-hmm. And Nirvana played one of their first shows there, and they had 
I think they did just Credence songs. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah. They had a, some guy with a mustache who was their drummer. Remember? <laughs> and yeah, and then they, they just, it was pre-Bleach, but there were some songs. And then they went and did a, recorded some songs on a local college station. And that's where I kind of heard the more polished collection of, you know, stuff that would eventually end up on Bleach. And, but this, so the scene is starting to gel. It's starting to yeah. form. And it's very far away from what's popular in mainstream music yeah, at the time. Yeah, and no one's thinking You're in a bubble. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just to you, it's just, I'm doing yeah. this today. And I, I became a good friends with Bruce Pavitt, who was the founder of Sub Pop Records. Right. And I would, you know, hang out with him, go over to his place, and he'd talk about what, he gave me a ton of records. He was like, here's Surfer Rosa. He gave me that. Uh-huh. He explained, this band's amazing, and, and uh, this guy recorded is Steve Albini. He explained right, right. that. And then gave me, you know, a, a pussy galore, gave, introduced me to a lot of great music, and then shared his ideas. Well, like, this is Mud Honey. They're going to be my first band I sign on right. my label, and sort of his idea for his label. And then, you know, it became a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. It became ginormous. Yeah. There's those people along the way that introduced me to some amazing stuff. There's like Bruce, and I remember listening to that Dinosaur Jr. record. <laughs> you're living all over me that right. record and uh-huh. just okay this is what i want to do i want to make music like that now you're like you have a purpose and you have a forward momentum in your life but you mm-hmm. also have this baggage of and, and i and, and i don't know of a musician that i love that didn't struggle with it there's i don't know of a clean sober rock star during their ascendance uh-huh. a lot of them clean up later but even like a, somebody that i love and i've seen a billion times who never had a famous crash but like elvis costello yeah he's still like oh i was drunk for years i wrote that high on this yeah. i mean everybody's using and i guess it's just an element of being a musician i mean yeah it's just I like mean, i i think about was like, anybody it, did you know anybody that didn't do anything um I, the red hot chili peppers were they were all strung up, then they got clean. But I remember being on a... Clean is different from just being yeah, s- yeah. straight. But and- I remember being on a trip to Brazil with Nirvana, and just I went along just to go watch them play at this festival, and Red Hot Chili Peppers were playing, and Nirvana, and Alice in Chains, and L7. And I remember everybody being so wrecked, except for the Chili Peppers, which they would wake up every day and go on hikes on the mountain. And right, stuff. right, right. And yeah. I was like, ooh, that kind of looks nice, you know, to do that. <laughs> yeah. But still, I don't know. I can't. I, I guess Charlotte that Caffey tells that really funny story about making Rod Stewart stay up all night. And he's like, well, but I have a show tonight. I can't <laughs> yeah. stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, it's. It, Just I, do more drugs, you'll be fine. No, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think I really. What was the point of hanging out with someone who didn't do what yeah. I was doing? Well, I remember. Know? I remember reading a hundred years ago a story about Bob Mould comparing who's going to do the replacements mm-hmm. and how like the replacements were just the world world famous fuck ups, right? And like Bob Mould was like had the tour schedule, n- never bounced a check. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and no one, I'm like, yeah, that'd be me. Yes. Yeah. They're the, <laughs> yeah. My, my girlfriend says, whenever I'm, she catches me cleaning, Virgo's got a Virg, man. <laughs> That's right. Virgo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go. Virg's got a Virg, Virg. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are those folks I know, uh, but they always become tour managers, I think. Yeah. Right? That, uh, well, do, you, yeah. do you know Danny Bland? Yeah. Yeah. Danny's yeah. a really good friend of mine. And it's just like, yeah, that's who I'd super be suckers. Like. Yeah. 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 yeah, and now he works with uh, Dave Alvin, and, right. and 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 he tells a great story that like you know when he was touring with the with the Blasters in the old days, like after the show, he would literally write down the name of the hotel on their forearm because at least the cab driver could get him back. Nice. And now it's <laughs> and now it's like, did you take your heart medication? Did you right. take your blood pressure medication? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> but this is the part of the book that I that really struck me was that your bottom, which you write about very honestly. Uh, in turn, it hits so hard, it hits the reader so hard that you're so objective and about your bottom happens. It's not like the band breaks up and you find yourself with nothing to do. You're recording your second album mm-hmm. and you're on top of the world. And yep. you lived with Kurt and Courtney at the height of their fame and at the height of their tabloid fame and being in the center of that storm. Kurt takes his life. And then a month later, Kristen, Kristen yeah. takes your life. Yeah. 
And that that wasn't the final straw. No. I mean, as Kristen OD'd, and then she and I were, um, I'd just done my first 30 days in um, Mm -hmm. rehab, the beginning of many. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, she overdosed and died. And that was a a moment where we all kind of took a minute. And then, you know, we just recorded this record and we were going to tour for it. And it was a, I, it, wasn't a major wake up call. It was a minute for me to go, whoa, you know, and then I gave it kind of in earnest the, to try to get clean and sober, you know, and I managed to stay clean after that for maybe six months out mm-hmm. on the road. And we started touring for Live Through This. And that right. was a grind, you know, it was amazing to go to see the world. The and most to, ironically named yes. album in history. Yes. <laughs> but, it, Going through doing that and then experiencing kind of just where everybody was at, like culturally, everybody was talking about what had happened with Kurt, and then also us dealing with it internally and things people would say. And dealing with Courtney, who's not only her husband and the father of her child is gone, and people are accusing her of killing him. Yeah. I can't imagine living through that cauldron yeah and just taking that and then just kind of letting it sit inside me every day you right. know when and and then she just carrying him, it right? no, <laughs> <laughs> and carrying it around and then it just then when you get home from tour it's quiet you know, here i am with myself right you know? i couldn't it, there was no way that i could deal with just that quiet and those that thoughts and i mean as a person who hadn't really worked any kind of program at all so the relief came got home in my apartment called the dealer Mm -hmm. then oh okay i'm i feel good and then then comes that that rat you know that hamster on the wheel thing where i'm strung out we have to go back out on tour it's the worst way to live you know to like be stuck in some podunk town in wisconsin and try to figure out where am i going to go to score right and you can't get arrested because you'll screw up the tour. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a lot of people counting on you being there. Yeah. And, you know, if I got arrested, it's not like they would just cancel the tour. It would just, they would call up Joe Schmo and he right. would come and take my place. Yeah. You know, they so, would call up the guy that filled in for Keith Moon when he passed out of the Boston Garden. <laughs> yes. That guy. <laughs> just flies, just <laughs> yeah. flies around the country. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Talk about the uh, Michael. Beinhorn? Yeah. Yeah. That. That was our after our. It's such a. It's a. It's, it's a punk it's a, rock Ringo moment. It, it's such a, a cliche thing, though. It's like almost like like I was so naive to, to well, that. It's a, it's a, let's just just to put a celebrity Skin. live through this. Live yep. through this is a huge hit, right? A huge hit, mm-hmm. and you're and you drummed all over that album. Yep, 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 all <laughs> over all it. Yeah, and then you're a you're a successful band. Yeah, two asteroids pound your band, mm-hmm. Kurt. Kristen. Kristen. Yeah. Boom, boom. You survive. Yeah. Pick up the pieces, move on, yeah. finish the tour. Finish the tour. Limping along at the end. Right. Basically. And then you are getting, you're going to go back in the studio. That doesn't send you to the bottom. Of all the things, mm-hmm. a record producer yeah. comes in and I'm going to just tell you a part of that. Yeah. He's, just, he's just not happy with your playing. No. And, and you find out later he's not even listening to your plan. Right. It, we changed management. We got the rock, you know, machine management, the guys mm. that manage Metallica. And, yeah. you know, that was like, and um, and so their, their it, thoughts, and Courtney was all on board with it too, you know, like, like we're going to make this next step into arena rock. Right. So we're moving well, out. Because that's our, where all the best music is played. True. True. Baseball in a, stadiums. In arenas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, we start writing songs and we get songs together. And Billy Corgan comes in and, you know, twinkles the ivories a bit. Yeah. And so then we go into the studio. We get this guy who came recommended from rock and roll, basically. This yeah. guy had no cred as far as, yeah. like, the He's like, I come from. I, it, the way you describe him, and, and then I looked him up on <laughs> Google, and, I looked, uh, and it is one of those things where you go, like, yeah, okay. boy, if I was casting this guy, that's who I'd cast. <laughs> Um, but he sounds yeah. like the Bill Murray character on SNL with the satin jacket yes. when, when yeah. Gilda yeah. Radner would do Patti yeah, Smith. The, the night, 
Yeah. yeah. How about a little Tuski? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so he shows up and he's doing his thing and he's like, we get into the studio and we start uh, recording and he's like, do it again. And it was sort of like that thing where I describe it in the doc where I'm like uh, in a pitching slump. He starts to like pound me, mm-hmm. you know, like through the, yeah. through the glass, you know. And like, you're no, alone. Not the good. other bands, the yeah. band's not there. No. Uh, do it again. Do it again. And then, so pretty soon, and I wasn't going to give up. And I, I, yeah. And apparently, that's his mo. He shows up. He did it to the guy in Soul Asylum. He did it to the guy in Corn, or he, he does it to these, you know, drummers. And then he gets his guy. You know, jo- I call him Johnny One Take. Right. And he shows up, special gloves and shoes and right. a little ratatat, right. and comes in and just does all the parts. Gives him his money. He's out. Right. So does everything know, Johnny one take and, and, and I'm room. sure that if I listened to your t- your take and Johnny one take, yeah. I would not know the difference. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like, but, but what's uh, also but now, going is that, but, but also, so that goes on and your friend, Courtney. Yeah. Goes along with it. Yeah. Like they don't, she doesn't. That was the, the betrayal was my yeah. band going, I don't know what to do. I don't know. Yeah. And, and Courtney looking at me going, Pat, this is business. It's just business, you know, and and I I took it so hard because the it oh was, I would too I would have walked and later on learning you know there's a, a um, there's this program called musicians assistance program and it's called MAP and it helps musicians go into rehab and mm-hmm. and, and I met some guys in, in the MAP program at the meetings that were like that happens a lot you know like a lot of metal guys were replaced. And yeah. I and and still it sucks, but I didn't know that. Yeah, what and it's going and, on. and it's also it's like well the Wrecking Crew, you know, their right. entire band. Yeah, didn't I mean play. it would be cool if Al Blaine showed up. I yeah. would not mind at yeah. all. You know, if he yeah, showed but up. it's just this guy's friend. Yeah, so he. Well, it's like know, on the in uh, Please to Meet Me, the producer brought in Paul Westerberg. Just could not play, or it was Slim Dunlap by yeah. that point couldn't play this fill. But I and there's a great guy that can play it. Who is it? My son. <laughs> Oh my God! Was it a guitar part? Or yeah, a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think it was uh, on "I Owe You Nothing." It's that wow. big, like burning. And it, I think it's—I could be wrong, but if I remember the article, it was the was producer. it Matt Wallace? He did the I, re. Well, they had a weird producer on that album. Yeah, that was not. It was like a Nashville guy. I'm—I I'm, I'm, don't want to say too much because I'm misremembering everything. Okay. But I do remember that it was like, huh? Uh huh. <laughs> You know, I got it. I can't just say and point the finger at and say he did it all because I'm. I definitely had a part in that situation. Showing up just out of rehab. Hello. Yeah. You know, yeah. Who and, and not not. I hadn't been playing drums in a while. So that there's my part in that situation was just uh, there was so much more work I could have done to prepare for that. Mm-hmm. But also, I felt you know really robbed at that my opportunity yeah. no and i those know were I, my drum parts you know well and, you're an artist yeah you know and um yeah and you wrote those parts yeah so coming out of it i i th- the goal was this guy's just gonna play your parts we're gonna no one's gonna tell anybody we're just gonna keep on moving and and i i was so angry i said fuck you guys i would and too I, I checked I, out and you yeah. know went to heroin island right you know <laughs> stayed there right and um so they got another drummer and you know that's how right. it went down and that was kind of the the worst fear came true you know like all along when i was trying to negotiate yeah. my drug addiction and stuff was like well I, all i need to do is just keep my job and i'll be okay sure you know yeah and, and it's it also the feel like, and the gnawing feel like i'm not good enough i'm not good enough right I'm not good and enough, it's true is, you're not well it's just yeah. every addict's <laughs> you know. interior yeah. but that's then, every addict's internal monologue right. and then so i go to the other side of it and just start rehearsing like playing by myself and like becoming whiplashing myself you know like right. that movie, and trying to be so good that and there was really no i couldn't i i still have issues about going in the studio you know because of that whole time and mm-hmm. try to work on it if and if and if things aren't feeling good then fuck it i don't have to i'm not gonna no, do this I, I'm, and that happens to everybody i mean like i had a i'm pretty well respected as a comedian yeah and i've always worked here at the improv and uh, every a lot of my friends work at the comedy store, and I would never go to the comedy store. So, 
They said, you should call the guy at the Books and Comedy Store. And I, so I, about two years ago, a year ago, I called up and I said, hey, I'd like to come by and do some sets. And they said, hey, could you call back in a couple of months? We just passed a bunch of people from Flappers, which is in the comedy in world. Burbank? In Burbank? Yeah, but the it, musical analogy would be like, we'd love to have you come and play, but we've just got some kids out of a junior high band, <laughs> and we're going to let them try first. And they said, would you call back in a couple of months? And I just said, no. I don't need to do. I don't you, need to yes. do that. And it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Right. But it never ends. That feeling of like. The, I mean, I definitely. I'm butthurt about it. Uh-huh. I'm still bitching about it two years later. Yeah. I haven't called back. I was like, fuck those guys. Mm-hmm. I don't need it. I don't. You know, I'm happy to go to the improv. Yeah. But but it was or were any other place. Yeah. But it's just like a moment and, over. And, don't you know who I am? Yeah, what you don't knows? want to say that. And it's yeah. also, I'm sure if I spoke to the person that I spoke to, they wouldn't even remember it. Mm-hmm. They're just trying to fill out a schedule. But unfortunately, they articulated the voice in my head that's like, yeah, you're not good. it doesn't matter that you've been doing this 30 years. This guy's been doing it six months and he's just as good as you. I'm like, Damn. yeah, fuck you. Mm-hmm. I don't think so, Bill. Yeah. In entertainment. Shit, it never ends. Well, it's it, it, the, the it thing about, ends. like, I don't want to be the drummer of Hole. I want to be, well, I'm a writer. Yeah. And, and I also do storytelling, and I do a little bit of comedy here and there. Yeah. And I don't want to be, like, I call it, like, I'm Gary Coleman situation, where everybody knows him from the kid from Different Strokes. Right. And, like, I don't want to be. But he's also a neuroscientist. <laughs> So I don't want to be like just that one hit. No know? one knows Gary Coleman, neuroscience. <laughs> the security guard. <laughs> Gary Coleman, I want neurosurgeon. Be, I want to be, like, I'm a writer. I'm not yeah, just yeah, that, sure. you know. Yeah. Like when you were drumming, like who did you compare yourself to? Like who was your drumming hero? Did you? Well, I love John Bonham. You know, right. From, and of then, course. you know, also the, my, my peers like Danny Peters and Bud Honey or Dave Grohl. Right. And any of those guys were. Right. And it's hard to. Be like, well, I'm just, I'm just me, and you have to accept that, like, well, we're not going to get to arenas. Yeah, but that's well, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to start my own band called the Foo Fighters. Right. And, yeah. And tour around. Yeah, and, and it's just like I'm now that. I'm going to be, I'm going to do what I do, and and John Doe is one of my heroes. Yeah. And I got to meet, you know, get to know him recently, which is surreal. And I've always equated my career to his career Mm -hmm. he would probably be offended to hear that but it's like yeah i never became a ginormo star yeah but everybody who matters respects what i do and a lot of the people that are bigger than me were inspired by me yeah yeah and i know that's true of him i mean like i mean i had a so, name droppy but it's like i had a long conversation with eddie vetter mm-hmm. about how amazing x is yeah yeah and it's I've just those and you moments just, when people come up and say you uh, inspired me yeah. yeah and their you know their career is pretty amazing at the end so that's uh, that's amazing to hear and that. you must still get that i, I mean, do yeah. and you know i still play out and it's sure. like really nice to hear that it's also nice to hear i read your book and i'm you know clean and sober and it inspired me that i can do it about X, that I huge fan of X also, and I work in a um, nonprofit called Rock and Roll Camp for Girls. And one summer, Xine came and volunteered. And you know, after like the third day of kind of, we kind of knew each other, just sort of acquaintances. About the third day, she was there. We, we were having lunch, and I sat next to her, and we talked a bit, and we. You know, I said, I just love your work, you know. And she said, oh, I love, you know, I like that thing you did with so-and-so, whatever. Mm-hmm. And she and uh, she had some, ex had some shows coming up. And she said, she talked about her band so respectfully. And so uh, when I talked about how important they were to me, she mm-hmm. expressed such a, a kindness and respect for her bandmates. Sure. After that amount of time, mm-hmm. so still loving their process and how they write and yep. them as musicians and people. It was so amazing. So much integrity, such an amazing woman. Absolutely. And all of them, you know, John, they talk about, I think by now, you know, they see the band as, you know, that's a boat that will always keep them above the waterline and they still create that. They, they have new songs. Uh, it's they just, so good to hear that because that's not the case. Mostly. <laughs> I, it's not. You know? And, and that they're still 
creating and and that's it doesn't it doesn't matter if you are playing the enormo dome uh-huh. or if you're at the whiskey if you're doing what you want to do people hate their jobs yeah and it you know people spend so much of their waking lives doing something that they're bored at or hate that you actually get to to, and and this is something that you you get with sobriety. It's like, oh, it's a gorgeous day. Yeah, to be grateful about it. Yeah, and, I almost got killed two months ago. Like, yeah. I'm really fucking happy that I'm here right now. Yeah, sort of um, gives you a little tweak. It gives you a big, <laughs> gives me a big tweak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. I was seconds away from sitting in the wrong seat. when the Pixies got back together and they started touring. And, Again, yeah, it, had to raid the Magic Castle was, to reassemble their band. Yeah, I, um, I, saw was them also- I was playing drums for Juliette Lewis and we were playing like some side tent and they were playing the main stage at the Voodoo Festival. Uh-huh. And, and I remember going to watch them and them opening, you know, and starting to play and like they played like, like maybe Bone Machine or something. Right. That feeling that I had when I first heard them it still comes still back. It's yeah. still that gets conjured up when I hear those songs. Yeah. It's so amazing. And only a few, you know, people have that ability to create that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's you only get to be new once. Uh-huh. And you only get with, with, with very few exceptions, you know, you you have an explosion and then then you've got another 60 years that you've got to navigate Uh and to be able to do that and still, and to be alive and to do what you love doing for me. And I having children is the most freeing thing because it stops being about you. Mm -hmm. So many people I know, it's like my career, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, it will make you see your career clearly. Yeah. Make you see what it is clearly. Yeah. My daughter could really, she does not care when, I, you know, oh, when no. I'm performing yeah. or whatever I'm I'm doing. And I played at, at her school. You know, there was a, some event where parents were you had to get together and play. And there's her school, there were some pretty amazing players as yeah, well. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. And, you know, the kids were like, oh, my God, I saw your mom play it. You know, and she's sure. like, meh, meh. I get concerned about not pushing her in certain directions. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, play, what does she want to do? Play the drums. She wants to, well, she likes dancing. That's, you know, kind of her thing, but it's always changing. So, you say that, you know, when so, is it going to so be? So pain. Yeah. <laughs> When's it going to, you know, like, what? what you know, my like, middle daughter's a cheerleader and I feel like I failed as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I made a cheerleader. I, my oldest daughter is, uh, you know, I'm in this uh, show, Creep Show, that's coming out on Shudder. Uh-huh. It's Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, the premiere is this Monday at the Egyptian Theater. And my oldest daughter is 17. She likes horror movies and stuff like that. And I was yeah. like, hey, do you want to go to the premiere with me? And she's like, I have tennis. <laughs> yeah. God. It's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, you can okay. walk the red carpet. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have tennis. <laughs> When you did, it's so great. When you did the um, the Zaya stuff for the uh, (laughs) that was like such a moment. And for me, and I I didn't get to go, but I I saw it on YouTube. And where was it at the Egyptian? Where where you dressed up like Zaya? Yeah, I did. I've done a bunch. Yeah, yeah, I've done it a lot. (laughs) The guy, (laughs) there's two guys at my kids at B school. Two other dads that are into apes. So okay. us three, we have our own ape club, we called it, privately. We don't tell a lot of the other. There was a fourth guy who wanted to get in, but we didn't. Not good enough? Yeah. And we all went to, was it UCLA or USC that had the... The USC. Yeah, we went there and we looked at all the stuff. Yeah, that was an amazing show. That I was an amazing show. any of the newer... Oh, they're great. The new ones? The, the, really? The, they're great. Well, yeah, like, they're great. Like, I really enjoy them. Like doc, like the Tim Burton one is atrocious. The but, like uh, Doctor Zaya said, there was basically no films after Battle. Was that what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have never heard of any of them after Battle. <laughs> and he lives in where is he lives Ohio. up in Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> That's so perfect. I live out near Susie Flechette. <laughs> and the other ape 
in the Yip Club. Robert Napton works at Legend Comics. He um, that's so he, uh, funny. Is, he went to the. It was a retirement home for actors, oh, for, and yeah. that's where the Caesar statue is. The Caesar statue used to be in my old backyard. Because I used to live in Roddy McDowell's old house, which was not intentional. Oh, my God. My my wife and I were looking to buy a house. And we were planning on having a family. And so we're looking around. And I wanted to live either in the Valley or in Larchmont Hancock Park. Okay. I didn't want to live West Side. I don't like the West Side. I'm not a West Side dude. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at this house in the Valley. It's too big for us. But we know we're going to have kids. And it was at the high end of our price range. But uh, we're looking at it. And the realtor goes, yeah, I guess an actor used to live here, this guy, Roddy McDowell. And I could <laughs> see my wife like looking at me. Like, and Because it's, it's not only my favorite movie, it's her father's favorite movie. Uh, so it was just uh, like, so yeah. that was a done deal at that instant. Right. The statue was not there at the time. It had already been moved out and refurbished by my friends and Put in the Screen Actors Guild retirement home, which is where he, your friend saw. Yeah, it. and Ro, it's Roddy's Rose Garden. Yeah, Roddy's the, Rose Garden. The Caesar yeah. statue from Battle. But I got the same guy made a copy of the Lawgiver bust from the original, and I put it in the backyard there. So I, I kind of reestablished it. Uh-huh. So the uh, Lawgiver. Oh, it's just it, there's no scroll or anything. It's not like it's just the bust. Yes. And, yes. Okay. And the Lawgiver statue is my my friend Brian owns the Lawgiver statue okay. at his house. <laughs> It, it's nine feet tall. It's, it's a it's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. No. Yeah. There's a, the people that are are in it are are in it heavy. But I don't know what it is about that thing. It was like Star Wars for another group yeah. of people that just like it just rings your bell for yeah. some reason. There's I don't a know why. theory that my brother and I <laughs> have <laughs> called background apes, and what it is is when you watch maybe it, not so much in the first, but maybe the second, definitely in Conquest, the, the bad mask and escape. Is in the background. You yeah. can see the, that. Oh, the beneath is full of bad. We call them bad the name. background apes. Yeah. Like, ooh, there's definitely a lot of background apes I, in this. Like I have the kind a half-assed budget. I have one of the chimp ones in my <laughs> other room because I lived before I moved into Roddy's house. I lived next door to Dan Streepeck, who ran the 20th Century Fox makeup department, oh, okay. and I met him at a neighborhood parking meeting. And I just recognized him from reading Famous Monsters magazine as a kid. Right. And I went, are you Dan Streepeck? And he went, yeah. And I would just recited his career to him. And he just came by my house a couple of days later and gave me an extras mask. It was the craziest oh thing. I, I, was, I, almost started, I almost started crying. Wow. I didn't know what and to say. And they look kind of funny, too. They they're look good. It's like, why don't you make them look as good as the makeup? They're yeah. all gorillas, mostly. Yeah. Well, there's, they're all bad. No, the chimp ones are bad, too. And they're then, all have bad. Have you seen the, um, yes, a lot I have. of those what black and white? <laughs> black and white uh, photos of of the making of, and there's all those body Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Little kid apes, yep. there, and sitting on lap, or maybe I have a photo. of it. Oh, We're gonna get back to track. Let's get yeah, old. now we're down. Well, I the came rabbit. to talk apes. Oh, goes, I didn't know that. Now yeah. we're down the rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, we're here. So. I have a picture of Felix Silla, who is a Hollywood little person, uh-huh. who played Tweaky the robot in the Buck Rogers TV series. Okay, he played the child gorilla that walks up to Charlton Heston at the in the funeral and goes, look, it's a man. Yes. Okay. I have a photo of his makeup artist, Don Cash, holding him up at a urinal (laughs) because he couldn't reach the urinal. And so he's holding him up (laughs) and he signed, he didn't sign it to me, but somebody took a screen. was like, when you gotta go, you gotta gotta go. go. Yeah. (laughs) And it is amazing that all of this stuff still, uh, still exists. And that's Eddie Murphy is a big planet of the apes guy. Really? Yeah, he is. And he had a really great observation about it, which I didn't know. It's the Wizard of Oz. Really? Like you go through this whole adventure and then it's like, oh, oh I was in and, Kansas and the whole the time. And you pull out the rug. Yeah, and get I was the in end. Kansas the whole time. Yeah. But that ending is so like used in so many. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. And if Simpsons. Simpsons did it and yeah. Spaceballs did it. And yeah. uh, yep. There was a funny, a lot of people claim to have come up with that ending. Uh, Blake Edwards was originally attached to the film to direct it. He said he came up with it. A lot of people came up with it. And I saw th- one of the producers, a uh, guy named Mort Abrahams, he spoke at a thing. Yeah. And somebody asked him, who came up with the ending? And he goes, Rod Serling came up with that ending. Statue of Liberty half buried in the sand is what you get when you write Rod Serling a check. <laughs> Which I loved because <laughs> it was so like yeah, meat and potatoes. Like, it. yeah, yeah, it's like it's, this yeah, is the okay. ask the line producer. He exactly. knows. Yeah. Ask the guy who knows where the trucks are. <laughs> <laughs> <Shimmy>. <laughs> 
you're married now? You're, yeah, married. Yeah. And then I... To uh, a dude? No, no. Um, I woman? got married to a woman in 20... Wait a minute. Wait, what? 2005, <laughs> we got together. We got married in 2008. We had our daughter in 2010. And just last year, we were divorced. Okay. So, that happens. Yeah. And we're... Uh, Said the divorced guy. Yeah. And I saw one of your stand-ups about, bits about divorce, and I was like, yes, exactly. Yeah. That's the way that um, a lot of, when I talk about my addiction, I, you know, I talk about the hard stuff, but I also make jokes about it too. Yeah, you, you have know? to. Yeah, And yeah. having that sort of connection with relating to your bits about divorce helps me <laughs> sort it out too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's, how do you get through it if you don't want to, you know, you can't find the funny parts. Somebody told a great joke. It's an old street joke. Uh, a, a comedian named Alex Edelman told me this joke last night. And it's a street joke, but it's a great joke about like you, you have to joke about everything. And the guy dies and he goes to heaven and he meets God and he doesn't know what to say to God. So he decides, I'm going to tell God a joke. I tell God a joke. And he tells God a Holocaust joke. And God goes, I don't think that's funny. Mm-hmm. And the guy goes, Guess you had to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had to be there. Um but now, yeah, now you're uh you're you're so, you're co parenting. Yeah, you're still making music, you're still, writing. Uh, yeah, I do um yeah. I play in bands still and you know do recording with friends when they ask me to yeah. you know, and then right now I'm doing a lot of storytelling of like the moth and uh risk. I w I'd like to do a thing with risk and and um, I've done a lot of UCB ASCAT monologues. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is so much fun. I can't see them doing with... sketches off of your mouth. <laughs> there's so much, like so many stories. There's stories I don't have in the book that I tell to that audience that, uh-huh. that are a little more. Uh, sure, yeah, hardcore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but those guys are, I mean, those ASCAT, but yeah. they're amazing. Yeah, Matt Besser. Yeah, yeah, like they don't leave any meat on the bone. I know. They and use Cedaro. everything. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's alarming. Scott, have you ever seen Scott Adsit improvise? Yes, yeah. It's, it's like I, it's not like comedians improvising. It's like no, this is what this is. Yeah, yeah. Janet Varney too. I never it's like really knew terrifying what it was all about until I witnessed. Yeah. what they do. Yeah, I like just well, you showing won. up without uh, carrying a drum kit. Yeah, and all, but also <laughs> like you, you won. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard like, to believe. Yeah, you're you know, still I, here. I, I you're still here. You what you've, I have and what do I have to offer? Is you know, yeah. I got some stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you lived. I mean, you, 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 yeah. you and I both know a lot of people that should be here that aren't. Right. And uh, that's the, it's a, yeah, I won. Yeah. Zabrecki, same thing. Yes. Yeah. His book's great. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, you're here. You're, you're, yeah. you, you won. You're, yeah. you're, you're doing shit. And that's the people that agonize over their level of success or whatever. It's just like, it's like, it's like, gla- it's, you talk about glasses yeah. in the book that, yeah. Lenses make you feel, you know, sometimes it's Fine. great when you put on glasses because you see these things clearly. Yeah. You like alcohol because it made you see them less clearly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a great observation. Yeah. But when you have that realization, if you're lucky enough to have it, that your life is about your life. Stephen King said, your life is not a support system for your art. Your art is a support system for your life. Uh-huh. It's like getting your the correct prescription. It's like, oh. Yeah. Finally, and then this it gets it. tuned in, and then yeah, like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the book is called Hit So Hard, and the documentary is also called Hit So Hard. Hit So Hard, yeah. They're really required uh, required viewing. It's it's really amazing. Thank Are you, you still friends with uh, the band? With the, with the band, well, yeah, yeah. She and I text a lot, and mm-hmm. uh, Melissa, is she up here down there? She's here actually, uh-huh. and Eric's in town too. And and Melissa's out in New York, and we I see her the most probably because oh, yeah? we both have daughters the same age, and mm-hmm. we get together. And yeah, there's a little bit of talk about getting the band back together. Sure. So I don't know that we'll see it when it happens if that ever does. I don't know. Well, I play the clarinet. That's Just right. keep that in yes. mind. Patty <laughs> <laughs> Shell, thanks so much Thank for coming you. by. Thank you. Other podcasts reach for the sky. Dana Goldbaum. We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. 
Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagool.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom. Peace out, peace out. You want me? Peace out. Boom. Mm-hmm.